Now right here I have two examples of pelvis models. And I have them here to show you the difference between a male and a female pelvis. There are a few things that we can look for to tell the difference. One of the things that we can look for, and probably the easiest, would be this infrapubic angle. Okay. You notice on this pelvis right here, it's an acute angle. Okay. But on this pelvis over here, it's an obtuse angle, it's wider. Okay. This would be a female pelvis. Some of the other things that we can look for on a female pelvis to identify it as female would be the pelvic outlet. Pelvic outlet is wide in the female compared with the pelvic outlet for the male, which is narrower. Okay. This is because, of course, Females have babies, and the babies need to exit through the pelvis. So the pelvis needs to be wider. Other things that we can use to identify the difference between a male and female pelvis, the shape of the obturator foramen. Now the obturator foramen are these large holes here. Okay. Now the male obturators are wider, almost as if these were eyes and the eyes were open wide, whereas the female pelvis, because this infrapubic angle is wider, the obturator foramen are squintier, is a word that I like to use, okay. or not as wide open like they are in the male. Another thing that we can use to help us distinguish between male and female pelvis is if we draw a line between the iliac crests and see where that line crosses the spine, you'll notice in the female that line crosses somewhere around L5. But in the male, since the male ilia are higher, if you draw a line across, if you draw a line between the iliac crest and a male, you'll notice that it crosses higher at L4. Okay. So that's another feature that can distinguish a male pelvis from a female pelvis. Now the true pelvis is down here in this area, and the false pelvis is up here. Okay. Now, some of the things that we can use as boundaries, one thing I like to use is this pelvic brim right here. Okay. This pelvic brim forms kind of a separating line between the true pelvis down in here and the false pelvis up here. The false pelvis would be located between the ilia, okay. inferior to the iliac crests, but superior to this pelvic brim. Okay. The true pelvis is down in here, inferior to the pelvic brim. Now, a couple of other terms regarding the pelvis. What's the pelvic inlet? The pelvic inlet, if you think of a baby being born, the baby would go into the true pelvis in this direction like this. So this would be considered the inlet, this pelvic brim, if the baby's moving through the pelvic inlet into the true pelvis, it's going to come out at the pelvic outlet down here. Okay? So some of the things that we can use to define the pelvic outlet would be the inferior ramus of the pubis and the ischioramus. Sometimes collectively we just call this the ischiopubic ramus. These ischial tuberosities okay, and the coccyx. And this coccyx, especially in the female, can move like so. In the male, the coccyx curves inward more, curves inward more to make this pelvic outlet smaller. These are the pubic tubercles right here, and this ridge 
that unites the pubic tubercles is called the pubic crest. This pubic crest between the tubercles is where the rectus abdominis muscles would attach. This right here is the pubic symphysis. These would be intervertebral discs, also a type of symphysis. This pubic symphysis right here acts like a shock absorber. So every time you take a step, the femur gets driven up into the acetabulum right here and forces get directed through the bone. Those forces will be absorbed partially by the pubic symphysis and also by the ligaments that make up the SI joint or the sacroiliac joint. This ilium and this sacrum can move slightly in relation to one another to absorb that impact. But sometimes the impacts get directed right up through the spine as well, and these intervertebral discs can help absorb that impact. If you found this video helpful, click like and consider subscribing to my channel. Don't forget to visit www.humanbodyhelp.com.